In this episode of Travelogue, we tour the lakes and mountains of Liangshan. It's a visual, cultural and literal feast, from pottery to pomegranates. Plus, we get a fascinating glimpse into a unique society where women rule and marriage, as we know it, doesn't exist. Welcome to Travelogue, where you and I get to discover the best bits of China together. My name is Min Zui Li, right, just call me Zui, and in this episode, as well as the next, I'm going to take you to the lakes and mountains of Liangshan in China's southwest. Now, here the cultures of nine ethnic minorities run strong, including the Yi, the Mongolian and Tibetan. And also, a long time ago, this place was traversed by traders on the ancient Southern Silk Road. As far back as 2,000 years ago, merchants passed through here on their way to Southeast Asia, India and the Middle East. Today, I'm not carrying goods to sell, only my trusty camera. I'm glad I brought it along because, well, it's obvious, I'll just let the magnificent scenery speak for itself. This vast range is the Daliang, or Great Cool Mountains. It extends across the border between the provinces of Sichuan and Yunnan. We're on the Sichuan side, in Liangshan Yi Autonomous Prefecture. Liangshan is home to the largest population of Yi people in China. But there's also a vibrant mix of other ethnic groups. So, wonderful scenery, rich ethnic culture, what more could you ask for? Today, why don't we start our journey in the prefectural capital of Yangshan, known as Sichang. And this place is said to be 50% urban, 50% lake and mountain. So, I am 100% excited to share this place with you. Let's go. We're starting our tour in the oldest part of the city, Lizhou Ancient Town. Unlike many of the more famous ancient towns in China, which have become quite commercialized and thrive off tourism, Lijou gets full marks for authenticity. While the locals go about their business, I go about exploring. Or at least, what I hope isn't trespassing. I've stumbled upon an abandoned courtyard, a grand old residence whose secret dusty nooks and crannies echo softly with muted stories of Eon's past. I can't help wondering what the families who lived here were like, once upon a time. This ancient town was once the northern gateway to Xichang City, and it was really prosperous because it was a very significant point on the Southern Silk Road, as well as in terms of military strategy. Well, these days, after a few centuries, it's kind of become a little more disheveled in appearance, but you can still see some remnants of its glorious past. There are seven main streets in Lichol, and as I walk through them, I'm drawn into a few more of the large courtyard homes. Some are in a very sad state of disrepair, but many are flourishing, converted into shops run by descendants of the original occupants, none of whom seem to mind me peeking in. Lichol ancient town traces its history back to the Ming dynasty between the 14th and 17th centuries, although most of the surviving buildings date from the following Qing dynasty. Still, it's not everywhere that you get to see original Qing architecture and design, with some tasteful new decorations, of course. This, however, is my favourite find so far. In the Tung family compound, it's a rare and intricately carved antique bed, generously embellished with gold. And my second favourite? This little hoot. Well, that's enough history for now. Let's look at present-day Sichang. 
The city center lies alongside Zhonghai Lake, the second largest lake in Sichuan Province. In recent years, the lake has been the focus of a number of sustainability projects aimed at protecting its environment. And the results have been extraordinary, so much so that Qionghai Lake is now a popular ecotourism destination. To traipse around the shoreline is to immerse yourself in the lushest of lush greenery interspersed with architectural relics from dynasties past. It's tremendously lung and soul cleansing. The climate is a definite plus two. Sichang is known as Spring City, warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And apparently, it also receives more than 2,300 hours of sunshine annually. That's an average of six and a half hours every day of the year. That makes for happy plants and people, naturally. Sichang also goes by another nickname, Moon City, because it seems the moonlight here is especially bright. I figured that there's too much to see and too little time using just my two legs. I get some help from a somewhat odd semi-reclining two-wheeler. And so, with minimal effort, I can take it all in. How picture perfect is this, hey? Well, Chonghai Lake is part of the largest city wetland in all of China. And it's a protected area that's got tons and tons of flora and fauna, and there's actually a walkway that runs around the entire circumference of the lake, which totals 44 kilometres, which is basically a marathon. So you can choose to walk it, jog it, or, like me, do it on a bike. If you tire of the view, or much likelier, tire of pedalling, you'll find peppered around the area several sacred spots where you can take a spiritual breather. Say a prayer, burn some incense, summon up some inner peace, and then hit the road again. This time, we come across a peculiar sort of landscape that's neither mountain nor lake. This is Huanglian Earth Forest. And by Earth, I don't mean our home planet. This is a forest of dirt. It may not sound very appealing, but in fact, this Earth Forest is beautiful in its own way and quite rare. At Huanglian Earth Forest, these strange structures aren't actually rock formations. They are compacted soil. And it's amazing that they haven't completely eroded from the time they were formed, about 80 to 100 million years ago. Now, I think the best way to enjoy this place is to walk around and maybe use your imagination. So, is this a medieval fortress or a dog or gigantic mushrooms? <laughs> Earth forests like this exist only in a handful of places in China, as they require specific conditions to form, namely tectonic movements, and specific conditions to last, namely a dry climate. Speaking of specific conditions, the one concerning me at the moment is hunger. So, back in downtown Sichang, I'm headed to a restaurant. It's called Asu Niu Niu, which in the Yi language means to sing and dance together. Well, it's been a long and exhausting, albeit rewarding, day here in Sichang, so I reckon it's about time that I get a decent feed. And what's on the menu tonight? Authentic 
ethnic cuisine. And the best thing is that I get a VIP pass to the kitchen. In the kitchen, Peng Shibin works his gastronomic magic. He's been a chef for 20 years, concentrating on yi dishes for the past eight. He tells me yi people like the food a bit sour and spicy. But the key is to retain the ingredients' original flavors. Here at Asa Niu Niu, something else that's important is presentation. <laughs> oh my god, I am ravenous, but this is just pure gluttony. I guess I'll start with this one then. Ah, this is <laughs> oh, you need some good jaw muscles for this, and maybe some floss afterwards. But it is very tasty. It's very flavorsome, even without the chili powder. <laughs> this food is just phenomenal. You know, I feel so lucky to be able to eat for pleasure instead of just for survival. And I've tried a culinary kaleidoscope of cuisine here in China, but this yi food is really, really up there for me. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up next, we head to the south of Yangshan, to the county of Huili, known for its colorful trifecta, green ceramics, copper hot pot, and pomegranate orchards. southern part of the Daliang Mountains area and we're in a county called Huili. It's known in China as the hometown of pomegranate and also of green glazed pottery. Now it's just waking up to another glorious morning. Let's see what we can check out here. Huili County is located at the southernmost tip of Yangshan Yi Autonomous Prefecture. And right in the heart of the old part of town, an ancient ritual begins the day. And this is how, even centuries ago, residents would be roused from the slumber every day. It's not a performance for tourists like me. It's just the way things are in Huili. Huili's history goes back more than 2,000 years, although most of the buildings you see today are much more recent, dating from the Ming and Qing dynasties. Like Lijou ancient town we visited earlier, Huili was also a notable military garrison and center of trade. There's one alleyway here with a very special claim to fame. It's said that every family living on Kejia Alley produced at least one successful candidate in the imperial examination. In one particularly celebrated family, 
members of three successive generations passed the notoriously tough exam. The old town also attracted many rich and influential families who migrated here from other areas, hence the large number of sprawling compounds like this. These days, each one is home to several families and the courtyards are open to visitors. I always enjoy seeing how people customize their living space while respecting aesthetic traditions. Places like this look so raw and yet so refined at the same time. And sometimes you can spot lingering traces of a lavish heyday, like these ornate green glazed pottery roof decorations. As it turns out, on our next stop, I meet a man who specializes in this green glazed pottery. He's a real local legend. Mr. Han is recognized as a master of intangible cultural heritage, the inheritor of the skills required to make this special type of earthenware. Huili's green glazed pottery is believed to have originated during the Song Dynasty, 700 to 1,000 years ago. Today, the craft is being continued in the hands of Mr. Han and his students. <laughs> of course, it's not a real travelogue experience until I get my hands dirty, right? <laughs> Yay! <gasps> so cool and silky to touch. <sighs> I think I know what my next hey, career hey. after travelogue is. <laughs> it's addictive. <laughs> in case you're wondering, the teal colour comes from malachite, a mineral contained in the glaze. It turns green after firing at high temperatures. It's not only Mr. Hahn's creations on display here, though. The compound also exhibits valuable ceramic pieces from various cultures, which together trace the development of human civilization within his specialist field. Next, another part of the local heritage created at high temperatures, but tailored more to my taste. Well, it is just about time for lunch, and these craftsmen need a break too. for this moment my whole life. All right, so we're at Huili County's most popular restaurant and we're about to try Huili County's perhaps most popular dish or at least a famous local speciality. So, uh, so we're going to try some Here we go. Wow, this is what we call the Zan Shui. We're Huili people. We eat fish. 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 特别是家里人来客人嘛,就杀鸡,就是这个红火锅。Huili oh. Copper Hot Pot is considered the epicurean hallmark of the county. Luscious layers of stewed meats and vegetables, what's not to like? Energy levels replenished, we head towards the outskirts of Huili County, where the hills are blanketed in groves of green. Pomegranates were purportedly introduced into China along the Silk Road during the Han Dynasty more than 2,000 years ago. Someone then discovered that Huili's soil and climate were perfectly suited for the cultivation, and now the area is the largest producer of pomegranates in China. Wow. 有三四副。剩下的两百的话都是十万以上。Oh it's like a chest full of rubies. You've got to love the pomegranate, right? It's such a versatile fruit. You can put it in curries and cocktails. But did you know in China it's also got important symbolic value? You might be able to guess what it represents from all the seeds that it has. Well, it's a symbol of fertility. I wonder what the birth rate is here in this village. Coming up next, 
A world so utterly different from what I know. A society without fathers, marriage, nuclear families. A society where women reign. And all this set in paradise. Well, we've now made it to the very west of the Dalyang Mountains area. In fact, this is where Sichuan Province meets Yunnan Province. And uh, this is the Lugu Lake. It's a very popular tourist destination around which live the Morsor people. And this place is also known in China as the Kingdom of Women. Now, I'm going to have a local guide to take me around the lake and also to tell me a little bit about her own culture, which is very, very special. <laughs> Lugu is an alpine lake shared by Yunnan and Sichuan provinces. More than half of it belongs to Sichuan, Liangshan Prefecture to be precise. It's much less touristy on this side compared to the Yunnan side. I mean, look at that. What you might call an unspoiled utopia. Several ethnic groups live along the lake shore, but because of their relatively large numbers, Lugu Lake is considered the home of the Morsor, often described as one of the last matriarchal tribes in the world. My guide, Aka, a Morsor lady, is taking me on a private boat trip to one of the many islands in the lake. It used to be inhabited, but today it remains as witness to a significant slice of history relating to true events that serve to bridge the gap in culture and communication between China's Han majority and the remote Morsor people. Xiao Xiao Shuming was 16 when she married the chieftain in 1943. She was clever and learnt the Morsor language within a year. With time, she took on the role of de facto community leader. She also facilitated understanding between her birth and adopted cultures. Through her, the world began to know about the mysterious Morsor. Aka also tells me about the walking marriage. In Morsor society, Couples don't live together as woman and husband. Instead, a man will visit his lover's boudoir at night and return to his mother's home before sunrise. Women are free to choose and change partners as they wish. Relationships can last from one night to a lifetime. The walking marriage is the best known but perhaps least understood aspect of Morsel culture. It seems very simplistic and very romantic. You know, relationships are based on mutual affection. There's no, I guess, no divorce and no custody battles. I think it really challenges the almost universal uh, concept of marriage. It's quite thought provoking. Chang 
在泸沽湖上，在泸沽湖上，风儿悄悄歌唱，唱开了繁华，唱开了繁华，温柔了山岗，我得到了世界。Fascinating, isn't it? Women head up the household and make all the business decisions. Property is passed down through the family line, and mothers have 100% rights over children born to them. Kids are raised by their mums and grandmas and aunts and uncles. In the Morsua language, there are no words for father, monogamy, jealousy, illegitimacy. As I meander among the Lugu lakeside villages. I can't help wondering what it would be like to live in a Morsua community. What a different world, indeed! I truly hope the Morsua manage to preserve their unique lifestyle. So, when I'm invited into the main room of a traditional Morsua home to witness a key ritual in a child's life, I leap at the chance. <laughs> This is a coming of age ceremony. It's held when a child is between nine and thirteen years old. A shaman decides exactly when. It's a huge deal. The boys and girls shed their simple children's clothes in exchange for colourful adult outfits, and from now on, they have the right to participate in religious ceremonies. For the mothers, it's an emotional afternoon. For me, it's been an extremely enriching few days in the Daliang Mountains, and meeting the Morsua of Lugu Lake was the icing on the cake. So far. Honestly, the Morsua way of life is one of the most intriguing things I've ever learnt about, and it's very beguiling, especially with this sort of backdrop, isn't it? Now we've been to the south of Yangshan and the west as well. Next episode on Travelog, we're going to be going to the east, and we're going to be celebrating the Torch Festival with the Yi people. It's going to be one big blazing extravaganza with tens of thousands of people. So you'd better join me. My name is Min Zui Li. I'll see you next week for some epic cultural pyromania.